This is a continuation of the last lecture, and in these two lectures, we are looking at the structure factor. Recall that structure factors are the link between the intensities of the peaks in the diffraction pattern and the positions of the atoms within the unit cell. In this lecture, we're going to look a little bit more at certain kinds of systematic absences and how they relate to the structure factor. And then we're going to see how the structure factor reduces in certain other situations which have important implications for interpreting X-ray diffraction patterns. So if we go back to lecture 20 on reflection conditions, we saw that there were certain symmetry elements when present that give rise to missing peaks. In the last lecture, we calculated the structure factors for a body-centered cubic metal, tungsten. And we saw how that when H plus K plus L was an odd number, the scattering off of the two atoms in the unit cell canceled out and the intensity went to zero. You can also go ahead and do similar calculations for a face-centered lattice or a base-centered lattice and show how the reflection conditions come out of the structure factor calculations. Here, I want to look at the other place where we see systematic absences, and that has to do with the travel symmetry operations, that is, the screw axes and the glide planes. So let's start by thinking about a screw axis and see if the structure factor calculations can show us where these systematic absences come from. We're going to look at a crystal that has a 2 sub 1 screw axis that's going to be parallel to the B axis. So remember that the reflection condition for this kind of crystal would be that the 0, K, 0 peaks are only allowed when K is an even number. So to keep it as simple as possible, let's look at the lowest symmetry space group we can that has a 2 sub 1 screw. And that would be the monoclinic space group P2 sub 1. If you look at the Wyckoff sites for this space group, you'll find that there's no special positions. There's only the general position. And the general position has a multiplicity of 2. And the coordinates of those two atoms are x, y, z, and x bar, y plus 1 half, z bar. Now, what would the structure factor look like for this kind of unit cell? Well, this is our generic equation for the structure factor of any reflection HKL. So here, because there's two atoms in the unit cell, we're going to have two terms. And we can write out those terms from the positions of the atoms. So the first term corresponds to atom number one at x, y, z. And the second term corresponds to atom number two, which is located at these coordinates. Remember that the reflection condition for a 2 sub 1 screw axis parallel to B is only going to apply to the 0, k, 0 reflections. Therefore, the H and the L are always going to be 0 for the peaks we care about. Plugging in 0 for H and L, this expression up here simplifies. And so the first term is just this one, and then the second term is this one. And the difference is we have Y as the position of atom 1, and Y plus a half for the position of atom 2. Well, can we further simplify this? We can. Uh, let's carry through the multiplication in the exponential of the second term. So we get the form factor of this atom. doesn't matter what atom it is. Both atoms have to be the same because they're related by the 2 sub 1 screw times e to the i 2 pi ky. And the second term is the form factor times e to the i 2 pi ky plus i k pi. A general mathematical property of exponents is, you know, e to the a plus b would be equal to e to the a times e to the b. So we can rewrite the exponential of the second term in the following manner. Now, the key thing is, let's look at this very last term, e to the i k pi. Right, k is an integer, and we can see from what we learned in the previous lecture that when k is even, this last term reduces to a 1, and our structure factor then just becomes this. Both terms are the same. When k is an odd number, like 1, then we have e to the i pi, or 3, e to the i 3 pi. And in that case, this term becomes minus 1, and so we have a difference instead of a sum of those two identical terms. And so when k is an even number, we get this for our structure factor, 
And the key result here is that when k is an odd number, the two terms cancel and the structure factor goes to zero. So that's exactly consistent with the reflection conditions for having a two sub one screw axis. Let's now look at the glide planes. Here are the reflection conditions when you have glide planes in your unit cell. Let's go down and look in detail the structure factors for a C glide perpendicular to the B axis. Once again, we can go to a very low symmetry monoclinic space group to demonstrate that. Let's say the space group is PC, right? So that means that there's a glide plane perpendicular to the B axis, uh, and that glide plane is a C axial glide. So if we had an atom here, we're going to mirror, and then we're going to translate by one half in C. Now, this space group also has no special Wyckoff sites, only the general position. And the coordinates of these two atoms are given here. We can write out our structure factor terms once again. Two atoms in the unit cell, so we have two terms in our structure factor. And I've just substituted in the coordinates of atoms 1 and 2 into these expressions. Now, this particular reflection condition is applicable to the H0L reflections. So therefore, it only applies when k is 0. And because k is 0, we can simplify the expressions. The middle term drops out. And we are left with this. Once again, we see a lot of similarities. But here in the first term, we just have a z, whereas in the second term, that coordinate is a z plus 1 half. So we can further simplify this by carrying through the multiplications inside the parentheses there. And in the second one, we get LZ plus 1 half L. Now, when you multiply 1 half L times 2 pi, you just get L pi. Right? So we can now split this second term into this one times E to the I pi L. Now we see a very similar circumstance to what we had with the 2 sub 1 screw. This e to the i pi l, when l is an even number, that term is just going to reduce to a 1. And in that case, we're summing together two terms that are identical to one another. So we come up with this for our structure factor. But when l is an odd number, this e to the i pi l becomes minus 1. Then we're taking the difference of two identical terms, and the structure factor goes to 0. Right, and that is exactly what is predicted for a C glide perpendicular to the B axis. We only see peaks when the L is an even number. Okay, so you can go back and look at any of those glide planes or screw axes, and you could do these kinds of calculations, and you'll see the origins of those reflection conditions. We can see what's happening here with the mathematics, but physically, what does it mean? Why does the structure factor go to zero? To see that, let's look at an example of our 2 sub 1 screw axis that is parallel to B. So this is a graph that we looked at in the previous lecture. If we have a plane of atoms here, and that plane of atoms is related to the one here by translational symmetry, they are one lattice vector apart, 1B lattice vector. And then if we had a 2 sub 1 screw parallel to B, then we're going to get another plane of atoms that is halfway between the two. This relationship of this plane of atoms being halfway between these two is dictated by the 2 sub 1 screw. Now let's think about the optics and the path length differences of these different uh, x-rays. As we have seen many, many times now in the course, Bragg's Law tells us that for wave 2, the extra path length with respect to wave 1 is given by AB plus BC, and that's going to be twice the distance between these planes times sine theta, and that distance here happens to be the B unit cell vector. And we also know from Bragg's Law that that should be one wavelength difference. Then if we look at ray 3, its extra path length, which is DE plus EF, Right. Everything is the same except for 
This distance here, the hypotenuse of our right triangle, is only half as big. So instead of being B, it's B over 2. And that means the path length difference from here to here is one half wavelength. Well, if you take two waves and they're off by a half a wavelength, that is a pi phase shift. They're 180 degrees out of phase, and they're going to completely destructively interfere. So we can see here why the 0, 1, 0 peak would have an intensity of 0. Now, it doesn't really matter where these atoms are in the xz plane, right? We saw from our structure factor calculations that because h and l are 0, all of the terms that have an x or a z in them are going to drop out. So I've drawn them all stacked on top of each other, but that isn't necessary. The only criterion here is that this plane of atoms is halfway between the top and the bottom plane of atoms. Now what happens if we go to the 0 to 0 reflection? This reflection is now allowed. The angle becomes more acute and therefore sine theta must increase. That means that the path length difference A, B, C is going to get bigger. And in fact now it's going to be two wavelengths path difference between wave 1 and wave 2. Now wave 3, well we know that that distance once again is just going to be half. So the total path length the DE plus EF must be half of the path length we saw for wave 2. We put in the numbers here and we see, oh, okay, yeah, it's going to only have a path length difference of lambda. But the path length differences being one wavelength apart, now they're going to add constructively. If we were to go to the 0, 3, 0, the red path length would be 3 lambda, and the green path length would be 1.5 lambda. Now they're out of phase by half a wavelength. If we go to 0, 4, 0, it becomes 4 lambda and 2 lambda. Now they're back in phase. And so that is the physical origin of these reflection conditions. We have to have that translational symmetry component to our screw axis or a glide plane. And that puts planes of atoms halfway between each other in such a way that we get perfect destructive interference. Now, while we're thinking about the consequences of different symmetry elements on the structure factor, let's think about the inversion center. So here I'm going to pick, once again, the simplest case I can imagine, space group P1 bar. And in that space group, if for every atom at x, y, z, we get another atom at minus x, minus y, minus z. Now, that doesn't give us any reflection conditions. This doesn't lead to any missing peaks. But it does have an interesting consequence on the amplitudes and phases of our scattered waves. Right, this is our generic structure factor equation. And now I'm going to plug in the coordinates of both atoms. And as you can see, they're practically identical, the two terms, except for the minus sign right here that comes out of the minus x minus y minus z position. All right, so what does that mean? Well, to understand the meaning of that, let's go back to the less compact trigonometric way we can write this, and that is, you know, e to the i phi is equal to cosine phi plus i sine phi. So I write out the cosine and the sine terms for both the first term in this expression and then here for the second term in this expression. Okay, how does that help us? Well, if we remember that cosine of some angle is equal to cosine of the negative of that angle. Right? Cosine of 30 degrees is equal to cosine of minus 30 degrees. But if you change the sine on an angle and then take the sine of it, that's going to give you the opposite sine. There's a lot of signs in there, but the bottom line is sine x is equal to minus sine of minus x. Using that relationship, we can write it so that the cosine and sine arguments are all the same. And now, if we look at this term and we add everything up, you can see that the sine terms cancel. And then we get this. So what does that mean? It means we only have a cosine term here. And this is always going to happen if we have a pair of atoms that are related by an inversion center. One way to interpret this is to go back to our definition of 
the phase of a wave that's scattered off of an atom, right? The phase difference with respect to an atom at the origin is given by 2 pi times HU plus KV plus LW. So if you were to take UV and W all to have the opposite sign, the phase shift of the X-ray scattered off atom 1 is going to be the same magnitude but the opposite sign of the phase shift of the X-ray scattered off atom 2. Here I think it's illustrative to plot our Argan diagram. So if we look at the wave that's scattered off of atom 1, let's arbitrarily give it some amplitude and phase, then the wave that's scattered off atom 2 is going to have exactly the same amplitude but the opposite phase. So they're going to be mirror images about the real part of our diagram. And because of that, when we add these two waves together to get the resultant wave that is, you know, the interference patterns between the X-ray scattered off atoms 1 and 2, we're always going to get a line that's on the horizontal axis, right? The sine term is always going to be zero. Now, if we were initially pointing in this direction, right, the red arrow could be pointing backwards, but it's always going to be horizontal. So what that means is if you have a centrosymmetric structure, so that all of the atoms have a partner that's related by the inversion center, it means the phases of your waves are all going to be either zero or pi, never anything in between. If we have a non-centrosymmetric structure, we cannot make this kind of generalization. So what's the implications of that? Well, if we step back for a minute and look at the big picture, what we have been talking about in this last couple of lectures is the idea that if you have a crystal structure, you know where all of the atoms are, then you can calculate your amplitudes and phases of all the scattered waves. And so we can calculate a diffraction pattern precisely if we know the crystal structure. But can we go in the opposite direction? In general, in crystallography, that's what we want to do. We have a crystal. We don't know its symmetry. We don't know where the atoms are. But we can measure its diffraction pattern. Having measured the diffraction pattern, can we go back and tell where all the atoms are? And the answer is, there's not a direct correspondence here. The problem is that when we measure the diffraction peaks, we can determine their position. That tells us about the unit cell. And we can determine their intensity, FHKL squared. Right? That's the term that shows up in our intensity calculation. But if we square the wave and look at only its intensity, we can get information about its amplitude, but not its phase. And this is called the phase problem. And that's why when you go from the diffraction pattern to a crystal structure, which I might say is just the art of crystallography, there's not a direct algorithm that just does that for you. We have to be kind of clever to figure that out. But one of the things that can help us a lot is that if we have a centrosymmetric crystal structure, then there's only two possibilities for the phase, either zero or pi. And that makes the job of solving the crystal structure of a centrosymmetric crystal easier than a non-centrosymmetric crystal. A closely related relationship is something known as Friedel's law, which relates the intensity of a diffraction peak with indices HKL and a second diffraction peak with indices h-bar, k-bar, l-bar. If we go back to our structure factor equation, and you can pretty readily see that the structure factor for f h-bar, k-bar, l-bar is going to look very much like f h-k-l, but there's just going to be a minus sign up here in the exponential. Now, if we think about the properties of complex numbers, if you just change the sign in front of the i, that is the complex conjugate of a complex number. So that means the complex conjugate of f h k l is simply equal to f h bar k bar l bar. And when we do the intensity calculations, remember we take the square of the structure factor. And for complex numbers, taking the square means we multiply by the complex conjugate. So f hkl times its conjugate, that's what f squared would be for the hkl peak. I mean, that's going to look exactly the same as 
the F squared for minus H minus K minus L. All right, so these two peaks are always going to be the same intensity, regardless of the symmetry in the crystal, right? Here we don't need an inversion center in our crystal. This just comes about because of the HKL terms. One way we can use this is it might reduce the number of reflections that we need to measure. If the accuracy with which we are determining the intensity of the reflection is good, you might think of it as a waste of time to measure the intensity of both the HKL reflection and the H bar, K bar, L reflection. So sometimes we don't have to count as long. We don't have to collect as much data. There are some other implications, which I'm going to get to on the next couple of slides. But one of the things I should say is that if you have anomalous dispersion, that is, if you're near the absorption edge of an element, then Friedel's law is not strictly obeyed. There are deviations from Friedel's law, and actually modern software programs use these subtle deviations from Friedel's law to figure out important things about the symmetry of crystals. Friedel's law also places some limits on how we can interpret diffraction patterns. So remember from our discussion of reciprocal lattices that when we collect a single crystal diffraction pattern, that pattern is actually going to be a cut through the reciprocal space lattice of the crystal. And the reciprocal space lattice is going to have the same sorts of symmetry elements that we see in the real space lattice. This particular diffraction pattern is a cut out of the A star, B star plane of reciprocal space. If you look at this pattern for a minute, you know, where the bigger circles represent more intense diffraction peaks, we can see that the diffraction pattern itself has a certain kind of symmetry to it. Right? We can see a mirror plane that's horizontal. We can see another mirror plane that is vertical. And we can see a twofold rotation axis at the intersection of those two mirror planes. Perpendicular mirror planes, that is a hallmark of an orthorhombic crystal. And in fact, this is the diffraction pattern of an orthorhombic crystal. So you see, we can look at diffraction patterns if we pick the right ones, and we can see certain symmetry elements that helps us assign the point group. And if we know the point group, then we can assign the space group. The limitation that Friedel's law puts on this, though, is to say that all diffraction patterns are going to have an inversion center. But of course, not all point groups have an inversion center. So if we were to just think about the orthorhombic ones for a minute, you know, one orthorhombic point group is 2MM, and 2MM doesn't have an inversion center. But if you add an inversion center, you're going to generate more symmetry operations, and you're going to actually end up on the point group MMM. So from the diffraction pattern, we cannot distinguish between 2MM and MMM. Because of Friedel's law, the inversion center is always going to show up in the diffraction pattern. So that takes us to this table, and this is an important table. So when a modern diffractometer collects a single crystal pattern, it's going to analyze where all of the diffraction peaks are. And it's going to try and do this inspection that we just did, looking for certain symmetry elements in the intensities of the diffraction peaks. And from that, it can say something about the point group. But it cannot uniquely define the point group. We were talking about the orthorhombic case. So in the orthorhombic crystal, there are three possible point groups, 222, 2MM, and MMM. And only MMM is centrosymmetric. But if you add an inversion center to either of the first two, these two non-centrosymmetric point groups, then you're going to get MMM. So all orthorhombic crystals, when you look at their diffraction patterns, it looks like they have MMM symmetry. And so we would call that its Lowy class. You have the same kind of situation for monoclinic. There are three monoclinic point groups, only one of which is centrosymmetric. But when you look at the diffraction patterns of monoclinic crystals, they all look like they have 2 over m as the point group. So we call that the Lowy class. And so the 32 crystallographic point groups we have reduce down to 11 Lowy classes, which are shown here. Right? And so from just an analysis of the relative intensities of different peaks, we can really only sort those 32 point groups down into these 11 Lowy classes. And then further analysis would be needed to differentiate between 
different point groups within the same Lowy class. So just to summarize all of the points that we've covered in this lecture, we saw that systematic absences that arise either from lattice centering or travel symmetry operations, those can be explained from structure factor calculations. And the origin of those absences is the fact that translational symmetry places atoms in a certain pattern that leads to integer and half integer path link differences for certain reflections. And those path link differences lead to complete destructive interference, hence the structure factor goes to zero. We saw that in a centrosymmetric crystal, any crystal that has an inversion center, the phase shift of any particular diffracted beam is either going to be zero or pi. Those are the only two possible values. Whereas in non-centrosymmetric crystals, the phase can take any value between zero and two pi. We saw that Friedel's law dictates that the intensity of two reflections that are the same indices but just minus one another, H K L and H bar K bar L bar, are equal. And then because of Friedel's law, it means that looking at diffraction patterns, we cannot uniquely identify all 32 point groups. We're limited only to the 11 Lowy classes. That's because even a non-centrosymmetric point group is going to have a diffraction pattern that has an inversion center.